Intersectionality is a buzzword that we've been hearing a lot of in conversations about feminism. Some say that if your feminism isn't intersectional, it isn't feminism. Others say that intersectionality as a concept has muddied the waters of an already complicated feminist discourse. So in this video, I wanted to investigate and answer what is intersectionality. Intersectionality is a term coined by civil rights advocate and law professor Kimberly Crenshaw. She introduced the term to feminist theory in her paper for the University of Chicago Legal Forum in 1989 called Demarginalizing the Intersections of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. In the paper, she discusses how what she calls the single access framework that's used to discuss discrimination has erased Black women. She discusses how often racial discrimination cases focus on black men and sex discrimination cases tend to focus on white women. She argues that this narrow focus distorts our understanding of both sexism and racism and that black women experience both of these things simultaneously. She renders heavy criticisms of the feminist movement, which at the time focused largely on white women's experiences with sexism, and the anti-racist movement that focused largely on how black men experience racism. Arguing that because a black woman's experience is greater than the sum of sexism and racism, that a black woman cannot simply be included into these pre-existing structures, but that rather these structures had to be rethought and recast. In her paper, she discusses a court case that occurred after the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, where five black women sued General Motors for specifically discriminating against black women when they noticed that all the black women hired after 1970 were laid off during the recession. They lost their case when the courts essentially concluded that there wasn't evidence of the company specifically having a bias against black people or women because they currently employed several black people and women. The women were all white, and all of the black people were men. And this was evidence enough to the court that General Motors was not discriminatory on the basis of race or gender. The court further argued that black women do not have a specific claim to racial discrimination that outweighs that of a black man. Crenshaw concludes that this means, according to this narrow view of single access based discrimination, that legally a black woman's experiences with discrimination are only validated by how close in proximity their experiences are to a white woman or a black man. In another case, she discusses how a black woman working for Hughes Helicopters argued that she faced sex and race discrimination when she noticed that black women, unlike the black men who worked at the company, weren't being promoted to upper level or supervisory jobs. The court argued that because she specifically argued that she was facing discrimination, not just as a woman, but specifically as a black woman, that she wasn't a class representative for the white women in the area of sex discrimination at the company. Crenshaw concludes that this logic reveals how white women are centralized in the discourse around sex-based discrimination cases. White women's claims to sex-based discrimination are seen as pure, which makes it so that even if a policy is against all women, black women are placed at odds with white women because the racism they experience makes the consequences of the policy harsher for black women. That not allowing those who experience multiple disadvantages to represent those who are singularly disadvantaged complicates the redistribution of opportunity and reinforces a hierarchy where white women are incentivized to protect the source of their privilege and their place at the top of the hierarchy. And this often leaves black women alone to fend for themselves. In another case, two black women sued a pharmaceutical plant on behalf of all black employees for racial discrimination. The court immediately argued that they could only argue on behalf of black women, but not black men. They managed to prove their case and they were rewarded back pay, but the back pay was only issued to black women in the company, not black men. She points out in her paper that while all three of these cases reach different and potentially contradictory conclusions about what is and isn't discrimination, that they all share the commonality of excluding the intersection of sexism and racism that black women experience, and that this particular type of discrimination materializes in various ways. She writes, I am suggesting that black women can experience discrimination in ways that are both similar and different to those experienced by white women and black men. Black women sometimes experience discrimination in ways that are similar to white women's experiences. Sometimes they share very similar experiences with black men. Yet often, they experience double discrimination, the combined effects of practices which discriminate on the basis of race and on the basis of sex. 
and sometimes they experience discrimination as black women. Not the sum of race and sex discrimination, but as black women. In the broader sense to how black women factor into the civil rights movement and feminism, she argues that black women are regarded as either too much like women or blacks, and the compound nature of their experiences is absorbed into the collective experiences of either group, or as too different, in which case black women's blackness or femaleness sometimes has placed their needs and perspectives at the margin of the feminist and black liberationist agendas. She argues that the very way that the law looks at discrimination is too narrow, that often it believes that you can be discriminated against because of race or sex alone, but not together. And because of this narrow way in which we view discrimination, the ideas of what discrimination is and isn't are viewed through the lens of the most privileged within the group, i.e. sexism through the lens of white women and racism through the lens of black men. And black women's experiences aren't considered at all. Ultimately, she argues that the elusive goals of ending racism and patriarchy are made even more complicated by the erasure of black women's unique experiences with both sexism and racism. Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality has since been expanded to include those outside of black and female experiences. But the general concept is that people can experience more than one type of discrimination, and that by not acknowledging this, the goals of both the feminist and the civil rights movement are made even more complicated. So today, an intersectional feminist is someone that acknowledges the ways in which multiple accesses of oppression can impact different individuals, who attempts to create a type of activism that is more inclusive of things outside of the dominant idea of what sexism looks like. Intersectionality isn't a collection of identities, but rather an acknowledgement that one person can experience different types of discrimination that inform each other. Well, I hope this video helps you understand intersectionality a bit better, and if you'd like to continue to learn, share, and grow, please feel free to stick around and watch some more What Is videos, and be sure to subscribe for more content.